Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Let's just begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our sessions. Father, we want to thank you once again for yet another week in our lives. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come and learn from your word week after week, oh God. And even as the seeds of your word is being sown in our hearts, oh Lord, we pray that it will bear fruit and you will use us, Lord, to multiply your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, we've been doing God's blueprint and we, we, we are looking at the 10 different perspectives or 10 different aspects of the local church. So let's just quickly do a review of uh, what we have done so far. Firstly, we, done, we did the local church is the body of Christ. Then we did the local church, which is the family of God. Three, the local church, the pillar of truth. Four, we looked at the local church as an army. Five, the local church as the bride. Then six, the local church as a house of prayer and worship. Seven, the local church as the temple of God. So now we'll get into the eighth one, which is in chapter 15, the local church is Zion, God's chosen people. Right now, uh, uh, we'll just go a little quick uh, because we have a lot of content to cover. But uh, again, as I say, uh, don't stop yourself from asking questions. If you want to share your thoughts, let's do that. But if I'm if I'm going quick in certain points, I'm doing it intentionally so that we'll be able to complete our portions. Okay. So chapter 15, the local church, Zion, that is God's chosen people. Let's read Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Anyone can read, please. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable com company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Je Jesus the mediator of new covenant, and to the blood of a sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Yes. Now, it's very interesting. The writer of Hebrews is addressing us as believers, as citizens of Zion, uh, which is Mount Zion, and he's referring to the Old Testament Mount Zion. Right? And he's saying, now, the Mount Zion in the Old Testament is a place, is a physical place. But now, in the New Testament, the Mount Zion is referring to you and I being in the kingdom of God, being part of God's kingdom. The people of David in the old, uh, sorry, Mount Zion in the New Testament represents the city of the living God and the people of God. So it's got a twofold connotation here. And one is, it is a city. One is, it is you and me. So when the Lord Jesus, now in the, remember this, in the Old Testament, it's a place, right? In the New Testament, it's a place and it's a people. He's calling us Zion. So a good example is, um, you know, when you read the Old Testament, um, every now and then you'll say, I, I, you know, the prophecies of, I spoke and uh, I spoke to Israel, referring to the people. But is Israel a nation? Yes, right? So you got God's covenant people, Israel, but you've also got the nation, Israel. So the same way, in the New Testament, you've got Zion, which is Mount Zion, which is a place, but also you and I called to be citizens of uh, Zion. First Peter 2, 6 says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Again, Peter is implying, uh, and he's explaining here, he's, he's, he's saying, Zion, as Zion, you and I are the chosen people. Right? We are the church. So when, again, it is, when God is looking at us, he's saying, this is my Zion. This is my people, my chosen one. Zion is the name often used as a synonym for Jerusalem. When Solomon built his temple in Jerusalem, that is Zion, 
expanded in the, in meaning to include the temple and the surrounding areas. So this is the physical aspect of Mount Zion. Zion was eventually used as a name in the city of Jerusalem. Now, the most important word use of the word Zion is in a theological sense. So figuratively, in the Old Covenant, the people of Israel, again, they're called Zion. Now, you and I, in the New Testament, we are the church of the firstborn. We are referred to as the heavenly Zion. Is there a place called Zion? Yes. But you and I are the heavenly Zion. Meaning, uh, as a body of Christ, God has a place. God has called us as Zion. Basically, it is God saying, you are my covenant people. I have chosen you. You are my children. Right? Now, God dwells and rules in Zion. So even as we go through this chapter, remember, we'll be looking at some of the Old Testament scriptures, but in the back of your mind, I want you to understand two things. Number one, old, there, there's a place called Zion, and there is a people, you and I, other, are the new Zion, the, the new people, the new Zion of God's kingdom, right? So you have these two in mind. So now Zechariah is saying, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. What is that? Meaning, he's talking to the people, right? For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Again, Psalms 2, 6 says, yes, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So God dwells and rules on his people. We are his people. God's kingdom, his rule, his dominion is over us. Now, as a local church, if you think of it, all across, you know, keep, let's take only the nation of India for now. With 1.3 billion people, there are hundreds and thousands of churches. Hindi, English, Marathi, all kinds of languages. But when the Lord Jesus sees, he's looking at one Zion, ruling and reigning from heaven. So the Lord Jesus is in control. He's an authority. His rule, his dominion flows into Zion. That is you and me as the local church. right? We are his people to see his rule and kingdom extended through the nations and through the ends of the world. Look at this. Psalms 50 verse 1 and 2. Out of Zion... God shines. Read that, Psalms 51 and 2. Psalm 51 and 2. The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth. From the rising of the sun to its going down, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. God displays his glory and his splendor out of Zion. So now he's not talking about a physical splendor or a physical glory. Right? If, you, if you've seen pictures of Jerusalem, it is a sprawling place. It's very, very beautiful, very scenic place. Right? You've got the Sea of Galilee on one side. You've got the plains of Megiddo on the other side. It's a very scenic place. right? And there's a constant breeze that passes by over the Sea of Galilee. Constantly there's a breeze. The moment you get into the sea, it's like a cool breeze. It may be hot. But there's a cool breeze. It's very strange, but it's a very beautiful place. Now, here, Paul, like the psalmist is not talking about the physical beauty. He's saying, I will release my glory. I will release my splendor out of Zion, meaning out of this, this people that I have chosen. And in the New Testament, out of the church, I will release my glory and my splendor. Deliverance on Mount Zion, Obadiah 1, 17 and 21. Let's read. Obadiah 1, 17 and 21. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord is. Deliverance and holiness will be in Zion among the people of God. Look at that. So everywhere we have Zion, just put local church or believers. Right? So 
deliverance and holiness will be in the local church among the people of god god's people will possess their possessions the deliverers that god raises up on mount zion will have rule over the unsaved and ungodly now when we talk about deliverance when we talk about this whole thing aspect of being zion now when you look at the other picture we also have a time and a place when you and i as believers will judge people in the heavenlies when we go on to be with the lord there will come a time right so the lord roars from zion meaning the voice of the lord is released from zion when you and i as a local church minister to people we are we are his voice right now jesus is not here right and right now the father is not opening up the heavens and speaking to us directly but he has given us the holy spirit and when you and i as a church we speak we are god's voice meaning we represent the father we represent a different kingdom right remember in school you have those different uh, you know school groups right you have the ncc the scouts or you have the you know the uh, house colors each of them are in different groups so they choose one person and that one person captain represents the entire color the house group and then you have one head boy he represents the entire school right so if there's any important meetings or if there's any important uh, programs the head boy is normally there but the whole school is not going and sitting there they send one person to represent you and i as a local church we are representing zion we are representing the lord and we speak this is so powerful imagine we are representing god if we are, we need to understand what we are talking why we are talking um, understand where we are what is our identity even as we talk to people then psalms 110 1 and 2 the lord releasing the rod of his strength let's read that psalm 110 1 and 2 the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand till i make your enemies your footstool the lord shall send the rod of your strength out of zion rule in the midst of your enemies yeah so this verse is is very uh, you know we need to understand this verse see the lord said to my lord and many times muslims people from other especially muslims they take this verse and say how can this be and the lord said to my lord but actually they don't get it because it's the father speaking to the son saying sit at my right hand till i make so the father is saying this that i make your enemies your footstool the lord shall send the rod of your strength out of zion rule in the midst of your enemies so it is the father giving authority to the son jesus christ and saying jesus the, your strength your rod and your strength will go out of zion that means the local church as as believers as a church your strength your rod will be released from zion that is through his people through his people he will rule in the midst of his enemies how are, how are some other practical ways that you and i can implement this in our life understand that we are god's own people as zion we are god's own people we are special in god's eyes we have a heavenly citizenship now listen if people around us look at us they may look at us as minorities they may look at us as weak feeble you know unworthy people following a you know a foreign god especially in our nation what is what is the bible say we are chosen we are special we have a heavenly citizenship so that's our identity so we must walk in that identity every local church must raise up a people who represent kingdom culture the local church must raise up a people who are holy sanctified and living transformed lives now again as you and i raise up leaders 
It takes time. We go through seasons. There are, there are seasons of learning, seasons of growing. And then eventually we want to see people coming to a place of maturity. Right? We are called to show forth his praises. As a local church, we must raise up people proclaiming the praises of God. Wherever we go, doesn't mean we go and stand in the corners and the streets and say, praise the Lord a hundred times. That's not what it means. What it means is we are called out of his darkness into his marvelous light. And we are saying, Lord, I'm praising you for what you have done in my life. And so we are being like a testimony to others. We're called to show forth his praises in our life. Then we are called to see his kingdom come, releasing his authority, his power, his kingdom, your honor. What are the challenges to be prepared for? Status quo Christianity. Do you know what status quo means? Status quo means people who are comfortable in doing what everyone are doing. Status quo. Everyone are coming to church on Sunday, but Monday to Saturday, they're doing everything wrong. So it's okay when I can do the same. There are many Christians in my office. They're all, you know, doing bad things. They do, they're living a sinful life. So that's okay when I can do. I'm not murdering anyone. I'm not doing some big sin where I have to go and sit in prison. But yeah, small things. It's okay. That's called status quo. Because everyone are doing it, it's all right. No, no, no. Now, this is a challenge that we must be prepared for. To stand out as a church. You may have believers who are, you know, not reading the word. Or not spending time in prayer. I can, I have two responses. I can say, hey, even he's not reading, even he's not praying. But the other response is, I'm going to do what nobody is doing. If they, if they have decided not to do it as believers, I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to follow what the word says. That is called breaking the status quo. Right. So these are challenges that we may have to face. Pastors and leaders, we have to teach and preach. We have to keep sowing the seeds and believe God for results. Believe God, trust God that the seeds that are sown in people's lives will bear fruit. Right? In a time and a season that we are living in, no, we want to see results very quickly. It's wonderful to see results quickly. But sometimes God makes us go through those seasons. Right? But remember, the seeds are being sown. When you go from here as Bible college students, five years from now, you should not be in the same place. Meaning, spiritually, you should be really grown up in your walk with God. Right? So when I see you, for example, I see you in 2030. You shouldn't be like, oh, uh, you know, I'm just still doing something. or No, it could be something small also in ministry. That's fine. But your spiritual maturity, your, your personal walk with the Lord should be way higher than what it is now. And same for me. When you see me, I should have grown. I should not be in the same place. Right? So as pastors and leaders, we must give people time. You sow the seeds, believe God to work in their lives. Right? So we come to, uh, it's a very small chapter, uh, the local church uh, as Zion, God's chosen people. But let's get into chapter 16. And this is a very powerful chapter. The local church, which is the vine and the branches. Now, John chapter 15, Jesus speaks so beautifully. He gives this whole allegory of the vine and the branches. Let's read that. John 15, 1 through 8. We'll get a context on what we are studying today. John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and he is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my father is glorified and that bear more, much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Now, Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples and he's painting such a beautiful picture. He's saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now understand, Jerusalem was known for its wine, wine presses, right? They were known for it. It was common. If you're walking down the streets of, of Jerusalem during uh, the time of Jesus, you would have seen you know, many wine presses. And many people who had fields, especially the rich, would you know, grow wine. And so it was common. Now, when Jesus is talking, he's talking in their understanding. Now, for us to see a wine press, we have to go outside the city. Right? You can't see anything around here. But that time, it was right there, available. And Jesus is painting a beautiful picture. He's saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. Right? And uh, so we're going to look at it two ways. As believers, we are the branches. As a local church, we are the branches. Right? We are designed to be fruitful because we are attached to the vine. Everything that flows in the vine goes into the branches. If you look at a, you know, I'm not very good at plants, but just basic knowledge, you have the main stem of a plant. And out of the stem come out the branches. But where does this, those branches get the nourishment from? It all happens from under the ground. The nourishment comes through that stem and it goes into the branches. Now what happens if I cut off that branch? Or just one branch, if I cut it off. Right. For example, it's just a a flower that's that's come out from the branch. If I cut it off, it's separated. Now, if I cut it off and I just keep it elsewhere, will it bear fruit? For how long can it stay that way? Maybe if you water it for some time, and eventually it's going to die. Why? There is no root. And what happens if I cut off the stem? It'll come back. Yeah. Here's the thing. Jesus is saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. And out of these, this vine, it will just automatically flow into the branches. Can the branch say, no, 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 I don't want this. I want to leave this. I, I, I don't want to be this attached to this. I want to go live separately. The branch has no say. If the branch tries to go and live separately, it's going to die. So here, we are connected to Jesus and we are to manifest everything that Jesus manifested in his earthly life. His kingdom, his rule, his reign, his attributes, everything flows in and through us. But here's very important, very, very important. Fruitfulness is birth in abiding. The word abiding means to rest. To rest in his word. To rest in him. Fruitfulness comes through intimacy with God. Now, just because Jesus is saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can bear no fruit. But if you are attached to me, we will bear, you will bear fruit. Now, I can't take that con out of context. I am attached to the vine. right? But I have to build the intimacy. Now, I'm attached to Jesus. If I want to know Jesus, there's no supernatural or super, you know, I can't click my fingers and say, okay, please help me to learn the parable of the lost son. I can't click my fingers and say, please help me understand the book of uh, Romans. It's not going to happen. Right? But if I have to be fruitful, I must abide in him. How do I abide in him? Two very important ways. One is through prayer. Two is through the word. 
if you have the word of god and prayer these two attributes if you set it right in your life personal life i tell you you will automatically bear fruit other things will come you have to do right so for example uh, worship leading you have to learn the music you have to learn how to sing example preaching right or teaching you have to prepare the sermon but whatever you prepare it can be a 10 minute sermon also you will bear fruit in that 10 minutes you get what i'm saying you know why because you have your fruitfulness is not in the sermon that you're preaching you may pre prepare a 10 minute sermon the fruitfulness is not in the sermon the fruitfulness is in your abiding in god's presence in worship i'm sorry in prayer worship and the word that's where your fruitfulness is that's where the intimacy starts and the reward of being fruitful is cleansing purifying so that we can become more fruitful so here's the problem as a local church what happens is sometimes nowadays we see in ministry not everywhere right but many times we've got leaders who are leading churches, who are wonderful pastors and all of that. But due to busyness, we sometimes tend to forget the main aspect of prayer and spending time in God's presence, especially in God's word. And then what do we try to do? We try to keep the wheels in motion. It will keep moving on. Right? So for example, uh, you know, a person, a pastor who's been has been there for 15 years, right? He's finished preaching on Sunday. He goes back home. Monday to Saturday, he can stay without opening the Bible, without prayer. Will he be able to preach a good sermon on Sunday? No. Why? 15 years he's a pastor. Think, think of what I'm saying. 15 years he's a pastor. Okay, he's been preaching every Sunday. But now he's preached on Sunday and he has decided, okay, so, so Monday to Saturday, he has not uh, opened his Bible. He hasn't read. He hasn't had time much to pray. But Saturday evening, he just opens. He comes up with one, uh, uh, you know, he takes up one topic. Will he be able to preach? Yeah, that's what I wanted. He will be able to preach. Right? He will be able to preach because he's, he's, it's a skill. Something that he will, he's been doing for 15 years. Right? Because maybe in the first year of his ministry, he spent five hours just reading the word and, you know, oh, I have to preach, preparing. But now he's got busy 10 years later. Or 15 years later, he's busy. He can preach. But then the fruit is not going to be as much as what it was 15 years back. So what's happening is the enemy tries to creep in this way. I can't make him sin because he's a pastor or he's a leader. He won't sin. He won't get into any bad habits. All that is very difficult. But I can try another way to stop him. What is that? Busyness. Or a feeling of, I know it already. I know the word. It's okay, I can preach. It's not like I have to go back and all, you know, nowadays it's so easy. You know, you go to AI, you put in your sermon topic, you'll get one 10 points, you preach it. You'll get it with the verse also. Everything you'll get. All you need is five or 10 minutes with AI. Your sermon is ready. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to use AI. I normally don't use it. But what happens is I can become dependent on that AI instead of Jesus, instead of the Holy Spirit. AI has no revelation. The Holy Spirit has revelation. AI will give you sermon points. That's it. Now you can use the sermon points, but the revelation, the fruitfulness comes from intimacy. So for example, it can be a simple thing on faith, right? Say one day, one Sunday you've decided I'm going to preach on faith. How Jesus took five loaves of bread, two fish, broke it, gave it to thousands of people. Simple. Everyone, the whole, every believer will know that. But if you have spent time in prayer, 
you have been connected to the one you're saying god you minister to people now the same message simple message 15 minutes you're preaching it will touch people's life for them something god will speak to them in maybe in a different way which we may not understand but there's fruitfulness right here second peter 1 5 through 8 but also for this very reason giving all diligence add to your faith everyone say add the word add means what something that's already there you're increasing it so add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge self-control to self-control perseverance to perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love look at that add to your faith virtue faith virtue means character knowledge self-control perseverance these are seven areas in which you and i need to keep growing in order to be fruitful seven areas now this is not an exhaustive list it's not like only this if i grow in that's more than enough no seven important areas where we can make a tab and check whether we are growing in the things of god right so how how are some of the practical ways we can implement this the local church can implement this uh, focus on emphasizing on the intimacy with god as a church we must teach people the importance of prayer if jesus did that so beautifully every time he in his ministry even in his tiredness even in his weariness he would take the disciples and say okay let's leave them let's go quietly elsewhere let's spend time together in prayer time to get time alone so when the disciples saw jesus they knew the reason he is doing all of this is not only because of his identity of who he is uh, as a son of god as a messiah but we also see him that his prayer kept him connected with the father so as a local church we must teach our people as a church we need to check up on fruitfulness the same way he checks up on us meaning we should always you know as a church as a local church keeps growing there are a lot of activities right conferences youth meetings men's ministry women's ministry. a lot of ministries will start off right now it, it can be very easy for us to be occupied with all of that and then suddenly we'll want we'll be focused on church growth suddenly we're focused on you know uh, missions all of this which is all important we, talk, we talked about it but as we are doing all of this the lord is not measuring our activity he is looking for fruit we can have 15 different conferences in a year 15 to 20 conferences each year and we can say okay we had a fruitful year yes but the fruit is not measured by the conferences the fruit is measured by how many lives have been touched how many people have been brought into the kingdom of god right so we need as a local church i think we need to as a church we need to balance both of it conferences are good it's important but also learn to see the fruit of it there are many conferences especially in apc there are many meetings conferences we've started and over time we have stopped it over the years because we didn't see any fruit i mean we can keep doing it but what's the point it's not like we want to just keep everyone busy or oh, come conference come event is happening no we want to see the fruit so sometimes our weekend schools we have only 20 people and about 20 people online 25 30 people at times and 20 people online a very small number compared to you know what we have on sundays but one thing we know is that it's bearing fruit why people are listening to god's word and they're seeing lives change we're seeing people growing in the things of God, right? So it's not a waste of time. We're seeing people's the fruit is seen in their lives. So, so again, we need to, as a church, we must be fruitful. We need to go through seasons of uh, cleansing and purging. Uh, God will lead us as pastors. He desires to bring the local church to a place of fruitfulness. So again, numbers is good. God said, I will, the book of Acts says he added people into the church. Numbers is good. Numbers is important. 
We need to grow in numbers. We want many more people to come into the churches, uh, learn and grow. But numbers is not the focus. Fruitfulness is the focus. Okay? So that is something that we have to teach our people. Now, challenges to be prepared for. Learning how to abide in Him. So focusing on intimacy is never easy. See, there are some of us who are very, uh, you know, action-oriented, meaning we always like to do something. Do you know people, you know, I don't know if you've seen these people, they cannot sit for a minute. Five minutes, they cannot sit. They just cannot sit. They'll do, like, the whole day they'll work. Morning, once they wake up, next day they'll sleep only in the night. My father is the best example. My dad is almost, he's 74 years old. He doesn't sit. He'll sit, he'll get up. He doesn't know what to do at home. He go, suddenly he goes out, he comes back. He would have gone out the whole day. And then we would have been tired, oh man, whole day we're outside. Suddenly evening he's gone for a walk. What does it mean? You know, there are some people like that. They can't sit. Now, the thing is, we must teach people to learn to abide, to sit and wait in God's presence. It's going to be very difficult for them, but it's a discipline that they should take it up as a challenge to focus on intimacy. Then you've got some people who can sit in one place, but their mind goes all over the globe. But they're in one place. They can think about anything, no problem. If they want to be on the Sea of Galilee, they can be there. If they want to go to Russia, they can go there. Right? If they want to eat something which they've never eaten in their life, they're already eating it. Everything is happening here. The mind is going all over the place. Now, again, it's a challenge, but there's a discipline. These are disciplines that we will have to teach them. It's not going to be easy, but we have to do it as leaders, right? Help people develop a place of intimacy. Uh, it is easy for an individual or a local church body to be satisfied with the measure of fruitfulness they already have. I think the most dangerous place to be for a believer is to be in a place of satisfaction. Even the great apostle Paul, towards the end of his journey, he says, I strain, forgetting what is behind, I strain to attain the goal and the purposes that God has for me. If I was Paul, I'd say, enough, no, you did enough. Did he do enough or no? Apostle Paul, he did so much. You know, first missionary journey, second missionary journey, beaten, shipwrecked put into prison, uh, you know, he met with the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself gave him revelations, such great revelations of God's word, writing all these epistles, so much work. You think it's easy to write these letters? Not easy, he would have written it, you know, so much of difficulty. And towards the end of his life, he's saying, I strain to press on more. I desire to, mo to know him more. That's my desire. That's what he prays. Now, the, that's the, that's the you know, mark that we must see. Are we satisfied where we are? If we are, we got to remove that satisfaction and say, God, I need more of you. That stirring in our heart. Just do that again. Right? Then some may not like the purging and the cleansing process to go to new levels. Hence may resist this. Now this cleansing and the purging process We'll have to, we'll involve cutting away things, cutting away probably friends, cutting away time spent in, uh, in leisure, meaning, for example, you can have somebody, you know, a believer can have many friends, and every Saturday you spend maybe the whole evenings, five to six hours just with friends talking, not maybe not doing anything sinful, but just being there with friends, spending time with friends, now, when it comes to being fruitful, sometimes the Holy Spirit may say, cut off that time. We may say, but I like to spend time, you know. 
we're just watching a cricket match or we're watching football, uh, not doing anything sinful. But the whole part of purging and cleansing, God may ask us to cut down. I would say this, you know, as leaders, leaders have some of the most loneliest lives. And it's true. It's true. Sometimes we can get very lonely because there, there are times when we will have to cut off people from our life. And I've done that many times, many of them. I, even now, I get a lot, you know, we are part of this WhatsApp group where all my school friends are, you know, the old boys' school. Uh, and so we have a WhatsApp group and they say, come, let's go. Yeah. And they know that I'm, you know, I'm a pastor and all that. Say, no, no, you come. We are not going to, uh, we'll just have some tea, coffee. And all that. And I keep telling myself, okay, these guys are calling. Should I go? Should I not go? Somewhere in my heart, I felt, I don't know. I still don't know, but I'm not interested in going. Like, I don't mind going. Like, these are friends. I'm going to see them after 20 odd years. So, um, we're having our 25th anniversary or something of our 10th standard graduation. I said, come, no. It's okay. We just want to see you. We've not seen you for so many years. I don't mind going, but I'm not, there's no interest. Right? Now, it's, I could be wrong. But the thing is, for me, is it going to bear fruit in my life? That's something that I always look at. Many times youth come up to us and ask, is it okay to listen to secular music? It's okay. Your wish. Is it going to bear fruit in your life? That's a simple question I ask. I mean, you want to listen, listen. It may be a simple song with, with no bad meaning or no bad words in it. Listen. Is it going to bear fruit? After the song, is it going to bear fruit in your life? That's all I ask. I said, no, but we feel, you know, happy after listening to the song. I said, okay, that's for you. Good. If you feel like, go ahead. Is it bringing you closer to God? No. Is it making you fruitful? No. But you feel happy. How long will that happiness be? 20 minutes. Then you want to listen to another song. Master, can I listen to this other song? This also has a lot of adverts. Good song it is. Listen. Now what's happening? The more, you know, you start debating with yourself. Okay, it's a good song. It's a good song. The next thing you know, you spend one hour listening to Secular songs, nothing wrong. But that same one now, you could have done something else and been more fruitful. I'm not talking about go lock the door, sit and pray on your knees. No, you can just read something. Not, it doesn't even have to be the word. It could be just reading something to improve your English. Or reading uh, 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 something related to the scriptures, you know, maybe a book. I love history. I love to read history. I'm very fascinated with history. I like to go through scripture. So I read about uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and then Alexander the Great. And when I read that, and I open the book of Daniel, it's perfect. It's perfect. Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had four kings, and those four rulers. Uh, become the leaders, and then that four becomes two. Now that, that comes the Roman government. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is we can learn many other things that is available. So some of the questions to consider. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cut, takes away. What does this mean? What do you think it means? Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That means what? Now, listen, the Holy Spirit is a dove. The Lord Jesus will, will correct us. He'll tell us to do things. But he, cannot, he will not force us to do things. Right? Now, there are, there are areas in our life we need to cut off. That's what it simply means. Right? I remember as a Bible college student, I knew one thing. I have to get rid of my phone. I knew it. As soon as possible, I had to do it. I knew it for a reason. Now, it was my choice. 
nobody came and told me my parents didn't tell me the lecturers didn't tell me my roommates didn't tell me nothing actually something weird happened since i was from bangalore and i was staying in the hostel the our warden said you can keep the phone it's okay everyone else was giving the phone you keep the phone it's okay because your brother keeps calling me and uh, you know for me it's very difficult so it's okay you can keep the phone i said no it's fine i have to i i'm not interested in this no because your brother calls me and then i have to go find because my my parents also would sometimes call on his number to talk to me i was just 2 kilometers away from my house still they'll call but anyways <laughs> you know uh so he said you keep it but i knew that this is maybe something in my life i have to cut off i have to do it and i cut it off my life now it's a choice that we make now when i surrender it to god he enables me to do it right he enables me to do it so that's what it basically means cutting off things in our life what are some ways that the lord would bring about pruning or cleansing in the church i think there'll come a time when the lord will just pour out his holy spirit in such a mighty way and we've seen this in revival where there will be a high sense of holiness unity um you know the welsh revival was so powerful the the people in the welsh revival they they were uh, you know uh, the pubs and all of that had closed down completely closed down right there was no work for people police officers didn't have any work the horses were so used to bad words that in the commands the horses were not even moving because people stopped using bad words also everything has changed the police don't have work pubs are shut down churches people every day morning to every day there was church services and events and programs happening i think the only way that can happen is when the holy spirit comes starts a cleansing from each person and then it just spreads out to the local church right so it's possible we are praying for revival it's possible for revival to happen we got to believe it we got to trust it see all these people here that you see right uh, smith wigglesworth uh, fanny crosby a blind woman wrote 8000 hymns it's possible god can start a revival he just needs willing people and um, once he does it nobody can stop him right right so we'll take a break we'll come back and we'll get into chapter 17